Hey you, how are you doing? Thanks for tuning in to On the Defense. This episode, we'll be going deep into cybersecurity and what finance leaders need to know about the latest threats in 2024. Our guest, VJ, is a seasoned cybersecurity academic who currently acts as the Global Innovation Chair in Cybersecurity at the University of Newcastle. He has led teams at organizations like HP and has been publishing work on cybersecurity for about, oh, 40 years now. It's a great conversation with some big predictions and some practical advice. So thanks again for listening and stay safe out there. So just to get us started, VJ, um, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you came to hold global positions in cybersecurity and academia? And how did you end up here? Thank you for, for this opportunity, Shannon. And I'm delighted to be here. I've been in cybersecurity for a long time. Uh, in, in, in some sense, it's good. In some sense, it's somewhat bad. I don't know. But uh, uh, look, I started... Uh, my PhD those days called security in, in the UK. So, uh, and then I ended up working for companies such as British Telecom and Hewlett Packard as a research manager and research uh, uh, head of research at uh, security for Hewlett Packard Labs. And then I switched to academia. Initially, I had a dean position, then I was a Microsoft chair in cybersecurity and uh, innovation. And now currently I hold the global chair in cybersecurity, which is appointed by the University of Newcastle Vice Chancellor. So cybersecurity is a fascinating topic. You know, when I started my PhD, I would have never thought I would spend the next 40 years in cybersecurity. But okay, what is the fascinating thing about cybersecurity? It's multifaceted. It's got multiple dimensions. It is, of course, got technology piece, which is a major piece, but it is the, the other pillars are business, uh, because all the things we do, cybersecurity things, uh, is related to different business organizations, different policies, different requirements, and the products and services provided by the different industry sectors. And then it has the society piece, which is the social piece, and which has become increasingly more important in the last decade with the social media and the way we use social media, the way the society uses social media. And then the fourth piece is the legal piece, the law. So all these four things, the you know, four dimension mixed together makes uh, cybersecurity uh, not only a challenging area, but also the area which is going to be there for many years to come because humans, we do not necessarily trust each other to the same extent, or trust also the technology we, we use to the same extent, we will always have cybersecurity. Probably we had security when we were in Stone Age, and we will continue to have security in many years to come. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And I think what you mentioned about all the different interlocking pieces, that is something that comes up over and over and over again, because there are so many layers to it. Um, and so you can't just look at one aspect when it comes to cybersecurity. There's so many different dimensions. And I think, like you said, that makes it super challenging. But interesting to me that um, you did get involved and did start to find it fascinating at such an early stage. And so it kind of speaks to maybe a little bit of um, foresight and prescience <laughs> on your part. And so I'm especially interested to, to understand um, how you see some of the things that are unfolding. Because if you do have that, that foresight to kind of know um, what's going to be very important both now and in the long run, then, you know, for instance, I'd be interested to know you know, what role you see um, businesses and, and the private sector playing. Like you said, um, there are all these dimensions, but increasingly, you know, the government has laid out their national cybersecurity strategy for Australia. Um, but I think there's this kind of big question around um, what role industry and business should be playing, especially since you know, we've got everything from large multinational corporations to very, very small businesses, you know, just here in Sydney or in Australia. And so I'm curious to know what, what you see as the role of business and, and what the private sector should maybe be doing or thinking of and, and, and how they can be helping the country kind of build a stronger security posture. Look, uh, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Yeah. Uh, but first, uh, let me say, you know, this foresight and uh, trying to not predict, but uh, understand what challenges we might have in the future. If you look at the tech sector, it is littered with many senior leaders uh, predicting this will happen and that will happen and so on and so forth, because we sort of uh, overestimate generally uh, 
what might happen in the short term, but underestimate what will happen in the long term with technology. But, uh, you know, the interesting thing about cybersecurity is as part of uh, being in this role, you have to have some idea of potentially what are the things that can go wrong. Technology is a double-edged sword. In other words, you know, you have good thing, you have a knife which you butter your toast. At the same time, you have a knife you can kill somebody. And that is true with any technology. So as a cybersecurity person, you have to understand what are the potential consequences a technology might lead to, which may be adverse consequences. It takes me back to when I was doing my PhD, I asked my I think the first week I asked my supervisor, what is security is all about? He tried to say something, which I still sort of uh, rings in my mind, which is, he said, security is about giving peace of mind to paranoids. <laughs> so in some sense, you have to predict or you have to be a bit of a paranoid as to what the attackers might do. A lot of it is relative. Peace of mind is very relative. Your peace of mind is different from my peace of mind. And that is sort of conveying the information, right? Basically, different organizations have a different a risk appetite, different levels of maturity, right, when it comes to cybersecurity, and, and risk appetite will determine what their level of peace of mind is. Paranoid is the ability to get into the minds of an attacker or a potential adversary and, you know, so understand what the attacker might do and therefore determine potential mitigations. So in that sense, yes, foresight is necessary. However, foresight, in my view, depends upon knowledge and the lived experience and the ability to understand the technologies coming in and how they are applicable in different sectors. And more you have this knowledge and expertise, I think you can have a better, perhaps a better prediction or a better understanding of potential consequences. So that's, that's where the foresight is. But then your main thing was, uh, you know, what is it that private or industry can, you know, how, what should they do or what, how can they help? Well, there is no such thing called absolute security. It is all relative, relative to threats, relative to the environment you're in, that is the context, and relative to some sense context and, uh, and the cost and the expectations. And when I say expectations, it could be the users, the customers, the community, the society, and so on. So it's all very relative. So in that sense, where does private industry come in? Well, private industry has got, a, first of all, a critical role to play because they are in charge of all, they develop the technology, they produce the products and services which we use, and therefore they have a clear responsibility in terms of providing the right security extensions or primitives or default security setups when they sell the product, which has not been the case. If you look at the tech industry, to some extent even now. Generally, what tech industry does is it develops a product based on functionality and features, what the users want. And if the users do not explicitly or say that they are interested in security or privacy on those types of issues, what is more important is, oh, it, it performs faster, it has got this feature uh, I want to use, therefore the feature versus security has always been an issue design choice in many of the tech products. So private industry increasingly, now what is coming to the, I mean, you referred to the cybersecurity strategy of uh, 2023. So essentially there is a increased responsibility being put on the private industry to take responsibility and embed cyber security features in the products by default before putting into the market. So that's something cyber, uh, private industry has got to do better and government is actually nudging them and pushing them, you know, clearly there are some regulations coming in, therefore the critical infrastructure providers have an obligation to provide security features. But generally, if you take a tech market like IoT industry, Internet of Things, you know, there is not a regulation at this, at this stage to say, hey, you have to, you know, have security features in that. And that's where clearly a private industry has got to take responsibility for, for their own products and services. But at the same time, the second thing is, you see, private industry, in fact, owns a lot of the infrastructures, right? The telecom infrastructure, critical infrastructure, whether the utilities, whether it is the transportation infrastructures. And, you know, increasingly cybersecurity or cyber attacks happen on all these infrastructures. Therefore, given that they own the infrastructures, not only the products and services, but they own the infrastructures, they have to provide security of these infrastructures. So that is another role. Internally, within a private industry, a large corporation, so they, apart from ensuring their products and services are secure, or by default, they have some level of security, they also, internally, they, they need to take 
you know, they need to be serious about uh, cybersecurity within their own organization. What do I mean by serious? I think there should be a, a, a you know, each security should be recognized at the board level. Nowadays, many companies have CISOs, but not all CISOs have, have you know, uh, have the visibility or the interface to the board. So it is important you know, there should be board level representation of uh, chief cybersecurity officers, CISO, whoever, you know, who's responsible for security in their organization, so that the board is aware of the challenges, what is being done, what is the threats that organization faces, what is the risk medication strategies they've got, and it has to be proactive, and the board needs to take responsibility for that. So that is important internally, in my view, and they need to have a champion in the organization, in each organization, to make sure that things are being followed through. This is extremely important. This is a, is a, you know, is HR people stuff. But often, where things go wrong, it is the people. How you, you know, not necessarily the technology, but people using the technology make it go wrong. So that is an, another important thing internally. Yeah, definitely, and it kind of goes back to what you said about a lot of this is so layered. There's so many dimensions. You know, you touched on the fact that a lot of this is comes back to people and policies around people and HR. And a lot of our audience, in some way or another, they're finance, they're AP, they might be CFOs, and so. A lot of times the, the crown jewels or, or the, the assets that are being targeted are either, you know, data or money. And um, when it comes to any sort of threats that are targeting money, a lot of times the finance professionals are kind of there on the front lines. And so while it might be um, a multifaceted threat that, you know, involves a supplier organization security, <laughs> for instance, um, it then ends up at the doorstep of um, just an AP employee who's now receiving um, very convincing um, emails or maybe even video calls of, you know, uh, changing payment information or, you know, urgent payments needing to be made. And so I'm kind of wondering for finance leaders in particular, like you said, um, security needs to be kind of taken seriously from the top down. Is there anything do you think that um, finance leaders could do, even though they're not technically sitting in, you know, a security space? It does kind of touch everything. So I'm wondering, do they have a role to play in kind of pushing their organizations to uh, take these sorts of threats more seriously? Well, you know, when you look at uh, security attacks, a major driving force is money. Right, you say money and data, but the data is uh, is a vehicle to earn money because data is used to generate money. So money is probably a primary driving force. You know, there are different types of attackers. You know, leaving the state actors uh, aside for a moment, uh, money has always been the primary driving force behind all these attacks. So there are two aspects to it. One is financial organizations. The second one is finance people in any organization. So uh, financial organizations have always been subjected to tax. In fact, finance industry is probably the most mature industry when it comes to security because they've been doing security for many years. So anything to do with finance is, is potentially subject to attacks, whether it is phishing, ransomware, all sorts of attacks that all that happen. But they are very well tuned to it. And there are regulatory aspects as well. For instance, in Australia, we have APRA which has, uh, I think, uh, CPS234 or something like that. There are, they, they've got to conform to certain standards, security standards. So that financial organizations are, I think, they have the ability, and major financial organizations, definitely they have the capacity and the capability to have strong security mechanism. And they, I think the board understands it. And uh, the only, only issue sometimes is how much... Uh, they walk the walk. I mean, they are, you know, they talk the talk, but uh, not all companies do the walk the walk, right? That is, that's that's the only, that's where the issue. Whereas, if you take a finance person, you know, whether it is a, a SME or a medium scale organization, or in a hospital, for instance, which is not a finance industry, but say a healthcare industry, which is another major industry in Australia and everywhere in the world, and the financial transaction play. A, Key role in addition to healthcare information, patient information, healthcare devices, and so on and so forth. So the role of a finance person in such organizations has got to be, you know, due diligence. And now, the problem is he or she is may not be attuned with, uh, you know, uh, security measures and security technologies. However, this is where I think, uh, you know, the representation of the chief security officer at the board level, where the CFO sits is critically important because um, not only the directors of the company will be aware of what is happening and therefore they can take appropriate measures. So the CFO will, you know, CFO is not going to be 
proficient in security. It is not expected. He or she is not expected to. However, he or she is expected to get advice, uh, recommendation from the CISO. Uh, I think that is important at the board level. But at the same time, I think there should be security officers associated with each department. In my view, yeah, and especially for security awareness, because often with the finance people, they got to be aware of the new threats coming in. And for that, you need uh, you would have some programs, awareness program, sure, but at the same time, you need a person within that organization, like, you know, we have a safety officer, occupational safety officer. We should have a security officer in each department, right? I think that is useful, especially in the case of finance, it's useful because, you know, that, he, that person, security person could help with the awareness, but also could provide a liaison between the finance people and the CISO and the security uh, people. I think that's probably the way to go. So not only at the board level representation, but also in subunits, you need that to you know to enhance the awareness. That's that's well, that's one way of doing it. So that's a really interesting um, solution. I don't think I've um, talked about that with anyone because, like you said, um, it's not just it being at the very very top level of the organization, but it's also about embedding it throughout. Because again, this goes back to the idea that. There's all these layers and it's so complex. But yeah, a lot of the scams, you know, uh, the scam attempts that we see in our organization that we, you know, stop with customers. A lot of times what's happening is the threat actor is capitalizing on the fact that um, there is a gap between the security team and the finance team because the security team might be amazing at what they do, but they're not privy or across all of the different financial processes or control procedures that that team has in place. And so there's these, you know, these, like you said, awareness gaps where people, um, they're very good at what they do and they know their area, but they don't know what they don't know. <laughs> and so, I, I, yeah, that idea, I, I love that idea of having somebody there to kind of bridge the gap. I've had this in my past life. You know, we have done this in the past in other sectors. For instance, when we want to translate some research ideas into products, what we used to do was uh, we, you know, we have the product manufacturing division. We used to embed an R&D guy in the manufacturing division so that he can, he or she can act as a liaison, but also contribute, you know, take the research ideas and inform the, you know, the product division. That's exactly the same idea here, whether it is the occupational health or whether safety. But the question often is the budget, right? You might argue that this is where you, when you said. For finance subunit, it is critical. It is a cost of doing business. I, I, I'm not going to say, look, every subunit should have a security officer, but I think you have some critical unit, such as finance, where you do want to have this liaison or interaction interface with the security team. Having somebody embedded is an excellent idea. Yeah, for sure. And it's about building, I guess, more protection around those areas or people or processes that are more likely to be targeted. And like you said, you kind of corrected, it's actually money is the primary driver um, in all of these threats. And so it does make sense for the money people and, and that function to have a bit more protection built around it. Yeah. And um, I have a question a little bit more broadly about Australia and New Zealand, if we can, you know, somewhat crudely group those together for the moment. We've heard, um, I think there was a, an alleged ABC interview with a hacker, a supposed hacker, you know, where he was saying, uh, or they, where they were saying, you know, Australians are kind of uniquely vulnerable to our attacks and they're easy targets. And we have seen that Australia does tend to be targeted uh, more often than other countries in various uh, scams and, and cyber attacks. I'm wondering what your view is on um, where Australia sits and, and why, if it's targeted more often, and, and if so, why might that be the case? Okay. Uh, look, I probably am going to... Uh disagree with uh, that statement what uh, Great. you know yeah Great. <laughs> because uh, cyber well let me say a couple of points i mean look cyber security is a global sport you know so in, in that sense uh, uh, all countries are subjected to it and all organizations in all countries are subject to it the question is always this you know what is this uh, low hanging fruits and the low hanging fruits in this is comes from at least a few factors one is you know how pervasive is the technology in a society Right. If you take societies like US, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, their technology is quite pervasive. And the second as factor is how much 
what's called mitigation security protection mechanisms or by default provided in the society infrastructures. And that's a bit complex question to say, but how much protection do we have? That's the second aspect. And the third aspect is, in my view, there are at least three aspects. One is, the third one is the geopolitical situation. And that has, uh, it has, it. what that, that does is it introduces a modulation to the attack. In other words, sometimes attacks are a bit more depending upon the geopolitical context uh, compared to other, you know, so one country, some countries may be affected uh, more uh, than others. So the pervasiveness of technology, uh, availability of protection mechanisms and the geopolitical context, I think they determine how many low hanging fruits are available for an attacker because attacker is always interested in low hanging fruits. If he or she can make money with, uh, you know, with the less effort, he or she will, the attacker will do that first. So as they say, you know, if when a tiger is chasing you, you just got to be faster than the slowest guy so that, <laughs> you know, you don't get caught. So clearly, if I look at these three dimensions, you know, three factors, where basically, yeah, Australia has got, a, you know, technology is quite pervasive. We do have that. And that is true. Now, the critical question is the second one, which is how much protection do we have? Right, with respect to the way we use the technology, what technologies we use. See, the, this question, it is, a, it is not a one-off question. So you've got to look at it over a period of time. So what has been happening is sometimes we are probably lagging behind and sometimes we are probably in par with the world. When we are lagging behind, maybe, and the geopolitical complexity introduces, we, we become more uh, attractive target for attacks. Now, when I say lagging behind, the products we use are very similar to the products we use, you know, are being used in other countries. So the question is lagging behind is usually with respect to regulations, government regulations. And uh, government regulations come in two forms, whether with, you know, uh, restrictions or uh, constraints, but also punishment. And in some aspect, the punishment have been uh, uh, not that significant for certain attacks, uh, well, like the data breaches, and that's been fixed now, by, or at least that is being fixed by the government. Sometimes we may feel that one country is more prone to attacks because of either uh, regulations are a little bit relaxed or because they are geopolitical uh, context uh, makes them attractive. But in my view, generally, I think Australia is... Uh, uh, you know, as a society, we are very similar to Australia, Canada, New Zealand, or UK. They are very similar. Of course, there will be pockets of it which will be strong and pockets of it will be weaker. So I, I'm very reluctant to have a broad brush to say, oh, Australians are easy target. I'm not sure. I think the better way to say that is this. It is not about a country. It is about organizations. I think this is the key thing in my view, right? Uh, the big problem is this. The big problem is there are lots of attacks which are mundane attacks for which technological solutions exist, but we have not deployed them either due to lack of attention, to say the better word, or maybe negligence. Uh, I think that is coming from the top down or carelessness. I think these are the issues. They are not sophisticated attacks themselves. The attacks are easily defendable. We can defend them, but it's just that some organizations have not had taken care to implement them. And that's probably a better answer than saying, we can, what is a country? Countries uh, has got a bunch of organizations, bunch of government agencies, but you know, this, that's what it is. There's no entity called country being attacked, right? Yeah, no, I like that view. And since you, you kind of clarified that it's really more about organizations, you know, we do have a lot of audience members who are leaders in their organizations. And so, you know, you've kind of touched on awareness and, and training a little bit already. I'm wondering what kind of practical things do you think um, organizations leaders should be doing when it comes to training and awareness and, and keeping staff kind of alert to a lot of these threats and, and avoiding some of the carelessness that, that, that you mentioned earlier? I'm wondering, you know, have you seen it done really well? Have you seen it conversely? Um, have you seen something that you, you think they should not be doing. Um, I'm wondering kind of what leaders can be taking away kind of practically going, okay, this is what I'm going to do or not do. 
Look, uh, apart from the fact that we've already discussed, you know, the the role of the senior management or a CEO of that organization to be committed to it, to be seen to be committed, the employees, the whole organization should see the you know, CEO person taking an interest, active interest in security and supporting awareness. That's the first thing. But apart from that, yeah, there are a bunch of mechanisms or these organizations, you know, different organizations use, whether it is workshops, courses. For me, the, the moral of the story with respect to awareness is it's a process. It is not an event. You have to do this continuously. Yes, senior leadership has got to show commitment, but it is the combination of mechanisms, but different audiences will have, you know, one mechanism will work for one audience, but not work for another audience. So this is a thing which, I mean, the organizations that I am aware of recently, uh, they use, what they do is, apart from having a, you know, a uh, uh, digital di- displays all throughout the organization and having workshops and having courses and testing. What they do is the security team uh, or the IT team, whatever it is, or the business team responsible for risk management and security, they go to different subunits and give, understand how that sub, you know, finance might have some peculiar uh, things they may be doing. They, you know, and these guys have got to go and understand that and then increase the awareness. For instance, if you take a university environment, this is very common. What happens, you know, you've got different faculties from medicine to engineering and they all have slightly different requirements and they want to get their job done, but they, they think security is a bit of a added over overhead and you know it's sort of acting as a barrier but if you go and talk to them and understand what, what they are doing and why they are doing it and then point out it is a time consuming thing but that is important because you can tune the awareness scheme slightly differently depending on the target audience after all in an organization you're going to have i don't know maybe 20 different types of unit there you know types of unit categories of unit so one of the jobs I will say the security people or the CISO's office should do is take time, apart from having the normal, you know, the workshop, you know, this type of uh, periodic testing or digital uh, things or messages and for awareness or asking them to take courses re- regularly. I don't know, maybe, I mean, if it's once a year, maybe it's too much, maybe once in two years, right? Go around each one of them, understand the specific things that each of these units are doing and explain to them where the security problems might arise. And I think it makes a huge difference when the CEO comes on the video or says, look, I think it is important for our employees to understand this. This is core for our business. And when he or she makes that statement, that makes an impact in my view. So these are some of the things with the right thing to do, wrong thing to do. Is, <laughs> look, there are lots of things which are the wrong thing to do. But I think these are the things I think can make a bit of a difference. I think you kind of touched on this, but it doesn't make sense to have a multifaceted problem and not have a multifaceted solution. Like you said, it's not one thing. One solution fits all. It doesn't work like that, especially in awareness, because it's people issue. And as you said, finance department is an important department. So they will have some specific concern because they might be doing invoices in a certain way. They might have customers, you know, ask, you know, they might be doing different purchasing certain way. So it is better to understand that and say, look, here are the possible potential pitfalls. Whereas the engineering department might have a completely different way of doing things and they might have slightly different problems. And maybe the problems are less, maybe more. I don't know, but they're slightly definitely different. Compared to finance, Absolutely. that's the, the, and the awareness is also, is matching your awareness to the target audience. But yes, it is time consuming, but it is worth doing, in my view, at least once in a couple of years. This is a very broad question, <laughs> um, so I'll just go ahead and preface it with that. So feel free to take it in whichever direction you prefer. But I'm curious to know, um, particularly, you know, somebody with your depth of expertise um, and obviously demonstrated uh, foresight, what is your biggest concern, cybersecurity concern for 2024? Is there anything in particular that kind of worries you um, more than it did last year? And conversely, um, is there anything that makes you feel more optimistic? Okay. (laughs) Well, I can tell you for the last three, four years, I've been talking about that since then. I think the biggest threat in my view for the society is the ability to distinguish what is true and what is not true. See, the elephant in the room we have not talked about is the so-called AI. 
look, uh, in the 80s, I, from 80s, I worked on uh, FL, those days, we used to call them expert systems. And, but look, my interest there is machine learning. That's the key area, and deep learning and uh, cyber and AI, the intersection. In fact, the hottest topic in town is the intersection between cyber and AI. And look, so where does that come to? I, mean, I think the biggest thing in my mind is the ability to distinguish what is true and what is false, because what is not true, rather, because that affects the core and the backbone of society. If you're not able to determine what is true, the whole st societal structure breaks down. We as humans, we will lose, uh, you know, we won't be able to function if we can't believe what we hear, what we see, what we, you know, uh, that's that's the problem in my view. And technology, unfortunately, has contributed to this problem in the recent times, certainly. By the way, much of this technology, what we see in machine learning is technical bit, where most of it was done in late 90s, early 2000s. It is now that we have the power of the computational power um, and the data we are able to collect, you know, we can come up with these predictions or we can come up with these ideas of generating content uh, which are similar to other data or other content that we have seen before. Biggest problem for me is the fake news or, uh, you know, basically not fake, necessarily news, anything fake, fake content, uh, whether it's audio, video and stuff. And uh, attackers can create these fake images easily and so on and so forth. At the same time, uh, we can use AI to detect what is a fake content, well, what is a malicious software. We do that as well. So yes, just, you know, it, it can help both ways. So the positive thing is, from a security point of view, we've always been chasing the attackers. The attackers have been always ahead of us, and we have been chasing, and we are still chasing. I think the positive thing is perhaps this AI can help the defenders to get a little bit ahead over time. Not at the moment, but over time. That is the positive thing. I, I think that's probably the hope I have, the optimistic uh, hope. So that that's sort of a broad thing, but I think much more, uh, I think, down-to-earth problem, which many countries are facing and many governments are facing or many societies are facing, is the uh, attack on uh, critical infrastructures, potential attacks. Because you see, the problem with those industrial control systems, industry systems are so old. Some of them, they are 40 years old, 30 years old uh, in the field. And we have the utility sector, for instance, uh, electricity, transportation, and gas, and those sectors. It is, uh, you know, it, they are much more vulnerable to attacks. And now we don't detect them often. And every, actually every week we hear that. I mean, last couple of weeks ago, I think 10 days ago or two weeks ago, there was this, uh, in the US, the port authorities were extremely concerned. The cranes and the thing were being, you know, potentially uh, uh, can be subjected to attack. So I think the critical infrastructure is what probably is the one which is a bit more of an immediate short-term impact. But the uh, Longer term, you know, so for the society, I think this is really we got to come up with some things so that we can identify the truth from the fake. Yeah. Those are the two things which keep me, which probably, probably the first one is what will keep me awake. The second one with respect to utility and all this stuff, I think we have techniques. We got to be more disciplined to deploy them. So that is in some sense in our hands. Uh, whereas the first one is, uh, is, you know, we at the moment, I'm not quite sure we have a solution at this stage. Yeah. I know you're talking about um, this kind of broader problem, and, and certainly <laughs> I definitely think, you know, the collapse of a shared notion of truth is, is you know, basically problematic for every aspect of society. But when we look at the organization and when we look at, you know, just, just looking at like a microcosm of, you know, when we look at like finance teams and we look at AP teams and their processes, we've already seen some of those procedures circumvented with for instance, synthetic media with deep fakes, um, with voice scams and that sort of thing. So it kind of goes back to what you're saying about we need to have a, a way to confirm the truth. And technology, you know, AI has kind of outstripped our ability to do that. We were already struggling to begin with. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm wondering, you know, is there anything that finance leaders can be doing or just organizational leaders in general? Like what small steps yeah, can they take Yeah, when we get now? into problems like this, uh, a, a technological solution in the past, and look, since 1960s, 70s, I know uh, from the computing technology world. See, the, the one solution is redundancy, multiple channels. How do you know what you see is the truth? Well, I checked the thing I looked at with multiple channels, with multiple people. That's the only way. But then here's the problem. 
the multiple people, do I trust them when they say that? You see, and the, one way is redundancy on multiple channels. This is what we've always done, whether it is network systems, all the things we do. Even take, uh, you know, I just take the OTP. You, you know, we send, uh, whenever I make a transaction, I get a, something in another channel. The mobile communication channel is different from the internet channel. And what it does is it, it is in real time, it is sending a number and it says that somebody is on the other end because having read this number, he or she is telling me another number. So it is happening in real time and it is in a completely different channel. It is not in the internet channel. So those are the two properties when we have that. And you will find that there are several technological solutions employ exactly the same multiple channels. So we add redundancy and then we have different sources. Let's say I'm reading a piece of news. Let's say I read something in the internet, but whenever I read something, I see next to me, BBC tells me this, CNN tells me this, you know, for the same information, CNN is saying this and ABC is saying this. If I get a bunch of this, then I leave it to the reader, to the audience to make the decision whether this X, what I'm reading in Twitter or this thing, this channel is true or false based on what the other sources are telling me. That is the only way. But yes, again, redundancy, as Sustanus, you do that, it has cost. It has a bandwidth cost. It has a time cost and different sources. You've got to trust levels of trust. I mean, is BBC more trustworthy than ABC? You know, those types of questions come in, right? So, but that is the only way to determine what truth is. Because at the end of the day, it is a shared truth, shared information. Now, we get echo chambers, right? Which are shared sort of <laughs> fake, right? These problems are not technological problems. What has happened? is technology has made these problems to come to the forefront because it has enabled these things. So the answer to your question is, is redundant channels or multiple channels and multiple sources. How do we achieve this in a practical way? There's a product out there, right? I'm sure there's a product out there. I, I'm the guy who is going to do this, or person who's going to do this, potentially ends up as a billionaire. But that is the way to do it in my view. Well, thank you so much, Vijay. Um, I, just to, to wrap things up, I'd love to know if listeners are interested in hearing more about your work or finding out more about you. Where can they find you? What should they follow? Okay, so uh, there is a web page called uh, ACSRC, which stands for Advanced Cybersecurity Engineering Research Center. If you just Google ACSRC and Newcastle, you know, you'll find this website. In that website, if you go to uh, uh, people, there is something about me, but Probably more important is it has the work that I have done, uh, been involved in over 40 years uh, in the UK, US, uh, Australia on a variety of topics uh, from encryption to autonomous systems to malware to AI and stuff. So that's probably the best place to go as a start. So ACSRC. Uh, Newcastle, just Google that one. But there are also other people's work as well. There's also ACSRC News. If you look at that, every month we do whatever we do goes up there. So uh, there's a bunch of information which may you may find it interesting. Yeah. Okay, thanks, VJ. I think we can probably also link some of those in the episode description for our listeners. And this has been super informative and really fascinating, and we appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, for your time, and thank you for doing the show on cybersecurity, which is an important topic. Thanks. Thanks again for listening to the latest episode of On the Defense. If you'd like to find out more about Fshore, you can follow us on LinkedIn or head to www.fshore.com. Thanks again.